Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome, to, welcome to all things ZFS. Uh, who here is not very familiar with ZFS? Okay. Who here is pretty solidly familiar with it? Awesome. Try to have something for everybody. All right. For those of you who raised your hands the first time, ZFS is a copy on write file system, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, it also takes the place of a logical volume manager and a disk array or RAID manager. Uh, when ZFS was a lot newer, most open source folks got really irritated and called it a rampant layering violation because, uh, you know, what normally would have been several components to a stack, uh, you know, MD RAID or hardware RAID plus uh, Linux LVM for vol volume management plus a separate file system, ZFS does all of those features all at once. Uh, there's a reason for collapsing those layers, though. You can't get all of the features without doing so. In particular, every block on a ZFS file system is automatically checksummed with a cryptographic hash that can be used to verify the correctness of the contents of that block. And if you're doing, um, if you're doing a parity or redundant raid, that means that if any block doesn't match its checksum, you know it's corrupt. You can go to the uh, redundant copy if it's mirrors, or you can reconstruct the block from parity and check the reconstructed or redundant block against its, its checksum. If that's correct, you can not only feed your user the correct uh, you know, valid data, but you can just silently immediately go ahead and repair the corrupt data on disk, which is awesome. Um, you also get uh, atomic copy on write snapshots. Now, atomic, of course, just means that they occur at an instant in time. Uh, you can't actually interrupt a snapshot. It happens in between anything else that's going on in the computer. So everything within a snapshot is consistent to that instant. Uh, you also have extremely rapid replication available, which we'll talk about later. Um, anybody in the room familiar with rsync? Anybody want to venture an opinion as to whether rsync can keep up with ZFS replication? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, it's also, a, it turns out it's a lot simpler. Um, when you're first getting started with ZFS, the sheer breadth of things it can do can seem kind of overwhelming. But, you know, if you're a storage administrator who's used to dealing with all these different, you know, components to the stack, it ends up being so much simpler just having to deal with one set of tools to accomplish everything rather than splitting everything up. And finally, performance. Uh, ZFS isn't always the most performant file system in the world. And you might be tempted to think, well, you know, it's doing a snapshot and, you know, comparing or it's, it's doing a checksum and comparing the checksum to the value of every single block it reads or writes. That means it's got to be slow, right? Typically, no. Uh, Well-tuned ZFS will frequently outrun traditional file systems like EXT or uh, XFS. Now, that's not always the case, and particularly once you get into really fast NVMe storage, you may have trouble keeping up with ext4 or XFS, but um, it's well worth it. All right, now for the folks who are fairly familiar with ZFS, this may be important because what I want to address here is one of the most common misconceptions. Uh, ZPools do not contain disks. Disks don't go into a pool. There's another layer first. Uh, VDEVs or virtual devices are what goes into a ZFS storage pool. Uh, that's it. Keep those things in mind. If you get confused about that and think, let me add, add a disk to my pool, you're going to confuse yourself eventually. So this is kind of what a Z pool looks like. And again, I've got the whole like no disks because the disks actually, actually go in those blocks marked VDEV. And you'll notice there are a lot of them in this particular pool. Uh, there's six VDEVs here. You can have any number of VDEVs in a pool. There is no limit to that. It's literally just, you know, how many devices can you cram into a system? And the pool will automatically distribute writes across whatever VDEVs are in. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. By the way, anytime any of you folks have a question, interrupt me. We got 90 minutes. I got 45 minutes a slide. If you do not interrupt me, I will not spend two minutes on average on every single slide. I don't care if you ask questions at the end or in between or say the heck with it. We all go home early. It's up to you. This is really your presentation, not mine. All right. So back to the whole theme of containing VDEVs, not disks. We see a little bit more detailed diagram of what a Z pool might look like. And we've got three separate VDEVs here. 
Now, the one at the top is a pretty wide RAID Z3 VDEV. You see that three of the little uh, drive icons are marked blue and the rest of them are that kind of charcoal gray. That's not actually the way things work, but it gives you some idea. Um, RAID Z3 is a striped RAID. So it's kind of like RAID 5 or RAID 6, but it's got three parity blocks per stripe instead of two or one. And the next VDEV down is a RAID Z2. And then finally, we've got a three-way mirror in the last VDEV. Now you notice those are all in the same pool. That's totally something you can do. You can mix and match any type of storage VDEV in a pool. The pool does not care. It just, just distributes the rights relatively evenly amongst everything that it finds inside it. Now, for the most part, that distribution is going to be according to the amount of free space that you've got left on each VDEV. Uh, ZFS's basic goal is to fill up all the VDEVs at a relatively even rate so that at any given time, they're all going to be 10% full or 50% full or 90% full. Uh, they'll become full at roughly the same time. It used to be that was the only consideration in the distribution mechanism for the pool, but things have gotten a little bit more complicated since then. Uh, ZFS also has some uh, load distribution algorithms. If you've got one VDEV that's, uh, that's loaded particularly more heavily than the others and therefore has less capacity, the pool may temporarily ignore that one uh, partly or entirely in order to get your rights committed to disk more quickly. But for the most part, again, what it really wants to do is keep them all at you know, about the same amount of fullness if it can. All right, so that's distribution. Um, one of the things, and unfortunately, even the ZFS developers say all the time that the pool stripes across the VDEVs, it absolutely does not stripe. It distributes. Now, RAID Z VDEVs themselves, they stripe. And it's much more like a traditional RAID 5 or RAID 6 that you might be used to. Um, every write to that VDEV will go across all of the disks. Again, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. You can see I said variable width strike. Now, what that means is typically an entire block will get split up amongst all the disks in a RAID Z VDEV. But if you've got a small block, for example, you might have just like a 4K file, and that one file is the whole thing. Well, obviously, you can't split that up across eight disks, right? Because 4K is just a sector on a standard drive. So even if your VDEV is a RAID Z3 and it has, you know, three parity blocks per stripe, what you'll end up doing is you'll only write one data block and three parity blocks for that one undersize stripe. That also means that... Uh, you can end up having some surprises in what the space efficiency of a really wide RAID Z VDEV is. Uh, it's very tempting to think, well, you know, if I've got a RAID Z2 and I've got 10 disks, then I'll have 80% storage efficiency, right? Because I'll write data to eight disks and parity to two of them in every stripe. But that's not always going to be the case because, again, if you have, you know, one of these very undersized stripes, you've got like a 4K file or you've got metadata blocks or whatever, what you'll actually end up doing is writing to three disks, one data, two parity for that particular record, which a little back in the neck in math, that's going to be 33% storage efficiency for that small file versus the 80% you might have more naively expected. So things get kind of complicated is sort of a, an ongoing mantra as you get more and more accustomed to how ZFS works, but there is always a good reason and it ends up being a lot better in the end. Now with a conventional RAID, uh, you genuinely would still end up with your 80% storage efficiency with our hypothetical, you know, single 4K block. Because what happens is it writes the one block and it writes or just doesn't bother to write another seven null blocks. And then you get, you know, your, your two parity on top of that, right? But then the next time you need to write, it has to pack that into that stripe, which means it has to read your existing block, write some new ones, recalculate parity, write that parity, so you've got this nasty read, modify, write cycle going on. ZFS never has to do the read, modify, write because it just wrote that as an undersized stripe to begin with, reads it back as an undersized stripe. You're not burning IOPS on just wasting time with all these other drives. You're not burning cycles on having to read, modify, write instead of just issue a new write. All right, so we, for the most part, covered this already, but for storage VDEVs, we've got uh, four topologies. A mirror, uh, that's the closest thing to a conventional RAID. Uh, there's really not much to talk about about how a mirror VDEV is different from RAID 1. 
it's still the same concept. If you write a block, you write that block to all disks that are in the mirror VDEV. That's all there really is to it. There's nothing else funky going on there. Uh, RAID Z1. Uh, oh, and uh, you may notice I said the mirror is one plus disk wide. Now, you don't usually find people talking about a one disk mirror. And in fact, ZFS doesn't really refer to it that way. But it's kind of easier to keep in mind that that really is sort of how it works. Um, you can have a single disk VDEV, meaning that it's just one disk in the VDEV. So it is sort of like you just added a disk to the pool. Um, but it behaves the same way that a mirror would. It just unfortunately does not have any redundancy. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, we're, we're gonna get to that in just a second, but uh, not at all upset about the question, keep them coming. All right, so uh, RAID Z1 is like RAID 5, but again, keep in mind, we've got variable stripes to deal with. Um, obviously, that starts at three plus disks, and you've got RAID Z2, which is like RAID 6, and finally, RAID Z3. Uh, there is no such thing as a RAID 10 VDEV, and I'm going to hammer on that again in a few more slides, because it's another one of those really common logical misconceptions that really holds people up from understanding what they're doing quote unquote ZFS RAID 10 is not a VDEV, it's a pool of mirrors. So for the Z pool itself, it's a lot like just adding zero on the RAID level of your individual VDEVs. A pool of mirrors is like a RAID 10. A pool of RAID Z1 is like RAID 50. Because if you've got multiple of these striped RAID VDEVs and then you're distributing rights amongst these multiple striped VDEVs, again, that's going to be like your really big conventional RAID algorithms, the RAID 50, the RAID 60, where you've got, you know, a, a, where you've got sets and subsets. Logically, it looks very similar. Um, again, no such thing as a RAID 10 VDEV. And this is kind of what it looks like in practice. This is a small pool of mirrors. You can see we ran a Z pool status command there. Are you all able to, to read that well enough? Awesome. So this is an actual Z pool status command that shows you the disks in there. Uh, you'll note that we, uh, the pool is named data. We've got two VDEVs, mirror zero and mirror one. You don't get to name your VDEVs. They just get named what they are and where they are in the pool. And then you've got the individual disks in them. Uh, this is about as simple as it gets. One thing that you will notice is that this pool uses the WWN ID number on the hard drives rather than bare device names like SDA and SDB. Uh, now, the reason for that is so that those WWNs are unique uh, at a hardware level to each individual drive, and they persist no matter what happens with the underlying controllers or what the operating system decides to do when it boots. WWN, you know, whatever 5A71 is always WWN, whatever 5A71. So it simplifies your life a little bit if you create your pool that way. Uh, the other thing is if you've got a system with uh, hot swap drive, with uh, hot swap bays, you can label your trays on those hot swap bays with the last four of the WWN. So then when you run your Z pool status one day and it tells you that, you know, one drive is degraded, needs to be replaced, you know which one to pull and slap in a new one rather than have to, you know, power the box down and, you know, read labels on the individual drives and hope for the best. Makes life a lot easier. A Z pool can absolutely be a MUT. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, you can mix and match VDEV types however you want to. Um, that's not usually what you wanna do if you can avoid it though, because your pool will end up basically having the worst characteristics of each VDEV type. So it's only gonna have the, if you've got uh, a pool with like a two drive mirror and a six wide RAID Z2, it's gonna have the poor performance of the wide stripe and it's gonna have the lack of parity of the two drive mirror. So you've kind of got the worst of all possible worlds. Not a great idea. Now, finally, the pool, and this is another thing that I, I see people not quite processing. The pool itself is not redundant. If you lose any storage VDEV, you lose the entire pool with it. So it's on you as the storage administrator to use all of your VDEV types with the amount of parity or redundancy that you expect your pool to display. So for a pool of mirrors, assuming two wide mirrors, it's gonna be just like a RAID 10, right? You can definitely lose one disc. You can probably lose another one because as long as the second drive you lose is not the other one in that same individual mirror VDEV, you'll be all right. 
Um, similar with RAID Z1, RAID Z2, whatever. RAID Z1 only, can only lose one disc per Vita, just like a mirror. RAID Z2 can lose two. RAID Z3 can lose three. Now, the other thing is that you're not necessarily only worried about the amount of discs that you lose before the pool just completely catches on fire and goes away for good, right? We talk about how ZFS has automatic data healing, but that data healing depends on you having parity or redundancy. So when you lose one of the two drives in a mirror VDEV, or when you lose uh, two drives out of a RAID Z2 and you have no remaining parity, you're, this is what we call operating uncovered. That means that now if you detect a corrupt block, you don't have any way to repair it, and you're going to have to skunk and restore from backup. Not a good time. ZFS also supports some optional VDEVs. Uh, there isn't really a technical name for like this entire class of VDEV. I like to call them support VDEVs just so there's you know, some way to refer to it all. You've got cache VDEVs, log, special, and spare. Uh, most people talk about the cache VDEV as L2 ARC, meaning level two ARC. Now ARC is one of the things that makes ZFS so great to begin with that we haven't talked about yet. It stands for adaptive replacement cache. Now, any other file system that you use on Linux or BSD or Windows, it's a very simple uh, first in, first out cache, right? If you read a block, you dump it into cache. You read more blocks, you dump them into cache. When you run out of room, the oldest blocks disappear out of the cache. Now, the problem there is even if you read the same block 50,000 times, once it's the oldest block in cache, it's gone. The adaptive replacement cache is a little bit brighter than that. I like to think of it as a weighted cache. So every time you read a block out of cache, it becomes a little bit heavier. It's a little harder to shove it all the way to the back. It's less likely to disappear out of cache. The result in that is you get a much higher hit ratio on ZFS art cache than you do on typical file system caches. That's one of the reasons that in practice, ZFS tends to perform a lot better. Even when the raw performance isn't quite up there with ext4 or XFS, the difference in how frequently you're not having to hit the disks to begin with plays an enormous role in the real world performance of it with real workloads. Now, that lets me explain why L2ARC is so misleading. Uh, the idea behind L2ARC is that, you know, when you lose blocks out of the ARC, rather than just disappearing into the void, you can instead push them onto this special VDEV, which acts as a layer two cache. Unfortunately, it's not actually a layer two arc. We just talked about what made the arc special and the L2 arc is not an arc at all. Uh, the cache VDEV is actually a simple ring buffer, no different than you know, EXT4 or XFS's cache. And it's fed automatically out of the back end of the arc. Now it's not fed by blocks disappearing from the arc. If a block is actually evicted, it's evicted and it's gone. What the L2 arc does is it scans from the tail end of the arc it blocks that are likely to be evicted and it feeds itself out of those blocks. And there's also a throttle on it because if it did that as fast as it possibly could, you would burn through the right endurance on a typical SSD in an extremely short amount of time. This is all tunable, but there's a default sane throttle level on the L2 arc that controls how deeply from the back it's allowed to read to feed itself and also how, how quickly it's allowed to feed itself and you can tune that, you know, if you have the need to, you can tune that, you know, to, to figure out, okay, how long do I expect my, uh, my cache VDEVs to last? How quickly do I read them? How much data can I save? The other thing about that is, as great as the idea of having like this fast solid state cache behind a larger, slower, cheaper, you know, rust pool is, in practice, it's not usually that great. Because keep in mind, the pool is cached with an arc its hit ratio is a lot higher than you typically expect. And the cache VDEV is not an arc. It is a very simple ring buffer. And there's not usually a very high hit rate on it because anything that you're even going to get hit out of the L2 arc to begin with has to be something you didn't have in the main arc. Making matters worse, obviously the arc lives in RAM, right? The, L, the, uh, the cache VDEV does not live in RAM. It's on a you know, separate set of solid state disks or whatever, but you have to index it. And that indexing takes up space in RAM, which means less space for ARC. And this is not as big a problem as it used to be because the index has gotten a lot more memory efficient on the cache VDEV, but it's still not usually a very big win for people. Uh, everybody wants to implement one. Very few people see real gains out of it. 
In particular, if you've got money burning a hole in your pocket, hang on just one second. In particular, if you've got money burning your hole in a pocket and you're trying to figure out how to spend it, if you can fit more RAM into your system, that's where you spend the money, not on a cash fee dev. The odds of you getting a bigger performance boost out of a cash VDEV rather than more RAM are basically none. Yes. Correct. It's on its, yeah, so the question was, uh, it, it seems a little uh, counterintuitive that rather than being fed by blocks as they're evicted, the ARC feeds itself out of blocks that are in danger of eviction. And a lot of the reason for that is because of the feed rate problem that we talked about. You can't just put every single evicted block into the cash feed of. So it feeds itself ahead of time, which allows the ARC to actually evict blocks rather than being unable to evict them yet because it has to store them in the cash feed of before it's allowed to put something new in it. You, you see the problem? Right, so that the, uh, the idea here is that the arc is allowed to just evict a block when it's evicted. Uh, hopefully that block will have already been added to the cash feed of prior to its eviction and that means that now when you, but um, remember, we've still got that index in RAM. So now if you attempt to read a block that's been evicted from the ARC, if it's still present in the cache VDEV, you can, you can tell that from the index. So rather than reading it again from primary storage, that's served from the cache VDEV rather than having to hit the metal. Make sense? Okay. Next up, we've got the log VDEV, which you will usually hear referred to as the slog. Uh, but when you actually interact with this VDEV type on the command line, it's not slog, it's log. And that's a sync write accelerator, and we're going to go into considerably more detail about that later. But basically, if you've got a workload that involves a lot of sync writes or, you know, making the actual sync function call where you're flushing all data out to disk, now those writes have to be committed immediately all the way down to stable storage. They're not allowed to be aggregated in RAM and then written out in nice, big, contiguous, uh, you know, high-performance chunks later, you have to get it done right then. And ZFS has a special way of dealing with that that we're, again, about to cover in a lot more detail with some images. I'm going to try not to get too far ahead of myself. But the idea is the log VDEV is a place that you can very, very quickly flush dirty data out when that sync call is made, which allows you to return from that sync call and do the next thing. Now, the other trick past that, if you're not an experienced storage administrator, you may think that you have a lot more sync rights on your system than you do. Uh, some examples of very important, uh, you know, server workloads that don't involve sync calls. A mail server is one. You might think that a mail server would issue a lot of sync calls as it flushes uh, messages to disk. It absolutely does not. Neither does a web server. Uh, neither does a standard file server. Now, examples of workloads that do involve a lot of sync writes are NFS exports, which by default, every single write is a sync write. So if you're doing NFS you really want to have a log VDEV. Databases issue a lot of sync writes. Uh, virtual machines typically issue more sync writes than if the same workload was on the bare metal. All right, next we've got the special. This is a very new type of support VDEV that's intended to, uh, if you've got a special, then the pool stores all of its metadata on the special rather than directly on the storage VDEVs. Uh, it can also be configured to accept, you know, very small block writes from how we covered if you've got just like a 4K file, it's, you know, it's going to be an undersized record. You can also tell the special to store these very small files there rather than out on the main storage. Uh, this is a really, really new type. I would recommend being cautious deploying the special for now. Uh, I have heard reports that it can greatly accelerate performance on very full, very fragmented pools, but it's not usually as immediately helpful as you might intuitively think. Uh, unless you have a really, really good need to try a special and see if it will help with performance, I do not recommend just blindly implementing one because it sounds like a great idea. One thing also to keep in mind, because if you've got a special, all your metadata goes onto the special. That also means if you lose the special, you lose the whole pool. So you have to make sure the special offers just as much parity or redundancy as the rest of the VDEVs in your pool do. That means that if you've got, you know, RAID Z3, 
three VDEVs on your pool with, you know, three discs of parity per VDEV, you're going to need not a three disc mirror for your special, a four disc mirror for your special, because it also needs to be able to lose three discs and still keep running. Very important. Our final support VDEV type is a spare, uh, also frequently referred to as a hot spare. Now this is a pretty neat little thing. Its job is to minimize your exposure window when a disc fails. If you've got spares and you've got auto replace equals on on your pool, and what happens is when one of your VDEVs throws a disc, the spare immediately leaps into the fray and gets resilvered into that VDEV to restore the parity or redundancy level of that VDEV. Now, this is not intended to be a permanent replacement. The normal workflow for this is still to go and get another disc and throw it in there and resilver it into the VM, uh, resil resilver it into the VDEV. And once the new permanent replacement is in, the spare automatically detaches itself and returns to service as a spare. Now, you might ask yourself, why would I want a spare rather than just going, for example, from RAID Z2 to RAID Z3? And the answer is that if you go from RAID Z2 to RAID Z3, for example, you have to have one more disk permanently attached to each VDEV, whereas the spare isn't attached normally to an individual VDEV, it's attached to the whole pool. So if you have one hot spare, in a, a pool with, you know, say 10 different VDEVs and 60 total drives, that one spare can leap into service for any one of those 10 VDEVs if it throws a disc. So this is not something that you usually really need or want on smaller systems, you know, with like, say, eight drives. But if you're talking about a larger array where, you know, you've got maybe a 60 bay server, spares can be a really, really nice thing to have. All right. So now let's get back to the log VDEV, or in this case, the ZFS intent log we'll talk about first. And we talk about how with sync writes, the whole thing is when, you, when, uh, when an application on the system calls sync, that means you've got to flush all the data out of buffers and get it onto non-volatile storage immediately. Now, the way ZFS handles this is it actually does those writes twice. It allocates a special area of your storage called the ZIL, the ZFS intent log. And if you call sync while well, you've got dirty data in memory, it immediately dumps those blocks into the ZFS intent log. However, that's not actually where they permanently live. That's just honoring what sync really says, which is make my data safe as rapidly as possible. But the data also still stays in RAM where it was aggregating, you know, waiting for a normal write to disk that's not very fragmented and is done in the sanest way possible, the highest performance way possible, the most efficient way possible. So you actually end up then with two copies of that data. But when you actually do the normal flush the way you would with an asynchronous write and you commit that data out to the, the rest of the storage pool where it would normally go, then you unlink the blocks out of the ZFS intent log. They're no longer leaded. They're no, they're no longer needed because you've actually properly stored the data now. Now, intuitively, you might think this would be a big performance lose, right? Because you've got to commit this data twice. But in actual practice, it's lots faster to do it this way than to do it than to handle a sync the way ext4 or xfs or over in the Windows world ntfs or in the Mac world hfs plus whatever. It's actually more efficient this way because the zfs intent log is specifically structured to be able to just immediately take these blocks in whatever shape or form they come in, just dump them in there and get it done with. But reading back from that kind of storage is horrible because it's maximally fragmented and it's tiny blocks and it bottlenecks everything awfully. So by committing everything if you need it immediately, but then writing it out properly later, you actually greatly improve performance. All right. Which we just talked about that entire thing without getting there. So you've heard that. All right. Now. Like I said, the, the ZFS intent log is not actually intended to read your data from later. It's only there in the event of emergencies. The only time that the ZFS intent log actually gets read from is if you have some kind of a crash, either in the ZFS module, the entire system, a power loss, whatever. The next time you import your pool, it checks to see if there's anything in the ZFS intent log. If there is, then it just, the very first thing that happens is it reads it out of the ZFS intent log and commits it to disk just like it would if it were a normal transaction group and it unlinks it from the ZFS intent log because again, once it's been actually committed, it no longer needs to be in the ZIL. Now that we understand this, it's really easy to explain the log VDEV 
it's just a fast place to commit your sync rights. It's still normally never read from again, only in the event of a crash, in which case they get pulled, you know, from the uh, the log VDEV and dumped back onto storage. But it's the same concept. It's still the ZIL. It just lives on a different and hopefully much faster device. Now, if you're going to have a log VDEV, one thing that people tend to get wrong a lot is they try to make <clears throat> they try to make it do double duty because the ZFS intent log does it never has to be very large. It will never hold more than the uh, the TXG sync commit interval worth of data, which by default is five seconds. So as much data as you can move in five seconds is the maximum amount you can ever need to store in the ZFS intent log. So a couple gigs is generally more than sufficient, right? But you don't want to go get the cheapest, you know, like four gig or 16 gig, uh, you know, EMMC or SD card or whatever you can find off of eBay for a couple of reasons. Not only because they're very low performance to begin with, and the whole point of the ZFS intent log or the, the log VDEV is to return from that sync call really quickly, right? The other thing is, write endurance for flash-based storage is dependent on a, the how much you've written compared to the size of the device you're writing it to. So your little four gig flash drive has incredibly low overall write endurance. The same thing goes for really small SSDs. You want an SSD that is much larger than the amount of space you'll actually need for the log VDEV just to get the write endurance out of it. Because again, keep in mind, you are gonna be moving a lot of data through there, especially if this is on a larger pool. You know, if you've got, let's say you've got a pool with, uh, you know, 10 drives worth of storage and, you know, they're individually 12 terabyte drives, all of the sync writes going through that, which may very well be every single write. Like for example, if this is an NFS server, they're all going to get shuffled through that one little SSD. So you want high performance, which specifically means low latency, not high throughput, and you want high write endurance. The other thing is that you don't want to, uh, you don't want to do double duty on one device. Another bright idea that a lot of people have is I'll get one SSD and I'll partition it and half of it'll be a cache VDEV and half of it'll be a log VDEV and aren't I clever. What usually happens then is you decrease the performance of the entire pool because you have set up some really, really funky bottlenecks and, and interactions that it, it's very difficult to predict or model. So don't do that. All right. Now, we can start talking about the volume management part of it. Um, underneath the pool, you have two different types of uh, storage containers, for lack of a better overarching word, data sets. Now, data set presents as a standard mountable file system, right? And then you've got Zvols, which present as mountable block devices. So if you create a Zvol, you're going to get a new device underneath dev that corresponds to the name of that Zvol, and you can treat it just like you would any other hard drive or SSD or whatever. So even though this Zvol is going to be backed by ZFS, it's going to have the data healing, it's going to have you know the ZFS intent log, it's going to have the ARC, it's going to have all these things accelerating it, making it better, making it safer. You can literally just format it with ext4 or xfs or ntfs or whatever and for all intents and purposes to applications installed on or depending on it it will be this familiar file system they were specifically designed to work with but under the hood it's zfs keeping your data safe making all these great things happen uh, data sets on the other hand there is no other file system involved it's literally just a separate file system um there's not really a great analogy to traditional stuff because like if you were going to compare it to, you know, LVM and logical volumes, you have to format logical volumes. Data sets skip that step. It is just a ZFS file system. You should absolutely create and use data sets. Um, although you can and uh, lots and lots of people literally just create a pool and dump stuff directly into the root data set of the pool. It's a bad idea. One of the reasons it's a bad idea is later we're going to talk about replication. You can replicate from the root data set of a pool. You cannot replicate to it. So that means that if you have, you know, really gone out of your way and created this amazing setup and you've got a production server and it replicates automatically to, you know, a backup server or even to an on-site hot spare and off-site disaster recovery and everything is, you know, replicating hourly on-site and daily off-site and it's all great. 
Then what you discover is when it comes time to restore from backup, you can't replicate backwards because while you could replicate out of the root data set, you can't replicate back in. So just make your life easier, uh, you know, create data sets, take advantage of it. And what you can see in this particular slide, you can see a terminal window here. That's actually my own home workstation. And this is uh, the contents of my images data set. And underneath images, I've got a separate data set for each individual virtual machine. And that means that I can snapshot those virtual machines individually. That means I can roll them back individually. That means I can tune them separately in a lot of ways that we'll talk about later. It's a whole lot better than just having a bunch of files dumped into a directory and called it a day. With that said, you don't want to needlessly create data sets just because you've discovered the ZFS create command and you're tired of the you know, MKDIR command. If there's not a real purpose to you know, carving out a separate data set and being able to tune it individually, snapshot it individually, et cetera, don't just go whole hog and create data sets for no reason. Like anything else, you do want to think logically, but keep that in mind. All right, now I've said the word block a lot of times already. It has a special meaning in ZFS. It's the basic unit of on-disk storage. So blocks are made of the underlying physical sectors on whatever your storage medium is. But a block can be not any given size, but it can basically be any power of two is what it kind of comes down to, right? So a block can be one sector. It can be two sectors. Um, data sets call their blocks records. So you'll see the term record size a lot if you read about ZFS tuning. Uh, ZVols, the blocks are still just blocks. It's really the same thing under the hood, but they call their blocks vol blocks. So for a ZVol, if you're tuning it, you'll see vol block size instead of record size. But the considerations are the same either way, and uh, we'll get a little bit more in depth with it. Blocks are written intact to single disks or to mirror VDEVs, but the block is exactly what has to be split up amongst all the disks in a stripe parity VDEV, right? So like your RAID Z2 is a lot like a RAID 6. If you got a 6 drive RAID, uh, RAID Z2, then you've got four drives worth of data and two worth of parity. So the block is what you're splitting into those four pieces and then putting two pieces of parity along with it. So if you've got a 16K record size, that means that your four data chunks are gonna be 4K each, right? If you've got a one meg, then they're gonna be 256K each. All right. So we already talked about how blocks are made of sectors. A shift is a property that actually tries to tell ZFS what the underlying hardware sector size is. And by default, ZFS will try to figure that out for you. It will query the firmware of your drives and ask them, hey, what's your hardware sector size? And if the drive says, oh, hey, I have 512 byte sectors, then ZFS will automatically set A shift equal to nine, two to the ninth for the VDEV that includes those drives. And it will go on about its business. Now, unfortunately, drives lie. I will give you one very, very common example. Does anybody here use Samsung consumer SSDs? Evos, Pros, Pro Plus, Evo Plus, all that stuff? Yeah, those all lie. Uh, the firmware on those drives claims that they are 512N, meaning they have hardware 512 byte sectors. They do not. The actual page size on those drives is unknown. Samsung does not specify it. But what I can tell you is that it is either 16K or larger. Um, I strongly recommend A shift equals 13 for Samsung drives. I recommend A shift equals 12, which means 4K sectors for everything. Because the thing is, if you guess too high on A shift, you have almost no penalty from that. There's no real performance penalty. There's not even really much of a storage efficiency penalty unless you literally have tons and tons and tons of files that are literally smaller than 4K, which you do not, it won't waste any space. It won't hurt your performance. Now, on the other hand, if you don't manually set your A shift and you use one of these god-awful lying drives like those Samsung Evos or Pros, and I use them also, you will absolutely murder your performance. Because remember we talked about read, modify, write cycles and how ZFS didn't have to do that? Well, if you tell it that you've got 512 byte hardware sectors, but the real hardware sector size is, you know, 4K, 8K, 16K, whatever. Well, now you're doing read, modify, write because ZFS thinks I can just write 512 bytes to disk and the disk will allow it to do that. But in order for it to do that, the next time you write 512 bytes worth, 
although ZFS isn't doing a read modify write, the drive is. It has to read those 512 bytes back out of that one sector, append 512 more, write those back. It's awful. Um, I found this out the hard way with Samsung drives uh, when I noticed that I had one system right here on my desk and one system right here on my desk, and both of them had four drives in, uh, in mirrors, right? But one of them had Rust drives and one of them had the Samsung drives, and the Rust box was faster because the, the right amplification penalty is so freaking bad for pretending to have 512 byte sectors when you don't. Um, if you don't already know for sure what the hardware uh, sector size is on your drives, you can find it out. Uh, FIO is a really convenient tool to do that, the flexible input output tester. You can just do an FIO write test, a fairly large one with 512 byte blocks, create a pool with A shift equals nine, test it, write your number down. Do it again with A shift equals 12, meaning the 4K sectors. Do it again, write your results down. Now do it one last time at A shift equals 13, which means 8K sectors. Again, write your results down. Whichever one was the fastest result, that's what you should actually be using in production. So for Samsung drives, you should use A shift equals 13. There's not a whole lot of difference between 12 and 13. You know, in terms of performance, I don't think either one quite matches the actual underlying page size, which I believe is truly 64K, but you want to get as close as you can, and this is how you do it. All right, back to record size and vol block size. So this is the maximum block size for that data set or Z vol is what you're really setting when you configure this tunable, right? And uh, because remember, now for, for Z vols, it, it's always going to be that block size no matter what. There's not really any way to have an undersized vol block in a Z vol. But for data sets, remember, if you write a small file, that small file is going into a small block. It doesn't matter if you have a really large record size. If you write a 4K file, it's only going to occupy a 4K record. So what you want to do is you want to match that record size to your workload underneath. And if you've got MySQL database binaries on this data set, you want a record size equals 16K because the page size for MySQL NODB is, you guessed it, 16K. So MySQL wants to read data and write data in 16K increments randomly inside very large files and that's what you want to tune your record size to. Similarly, uh, default QMU VM images are going to be uh, you, you know, using the QCAL2 format. That's going to be written with a 64K cluster size. So again, you're reading and writing in increments of 64K. You want your record size to be 64K. Finally, for anything else where you don't expect a lot of random IO, again, inside a much larger file, you want your record size to be as big as it can be because that way you minimize the amount of fragmentation and you also maximize the efficiency of reading that whole file in and out of disk. So for any simple file storage where you don't expect random IO, you want the largest record size, which by default, unless you go messing with some really weird things and you know, kind of strain off the ranch, is gonna be one meg. One meg is great. There's not a whole lot of reason to go digging into ZFS internals and enabling really huge record sizes because the neat thing is, People who aren't real familiar with storage, they, they really like to talk about contiguous performance because it makes the biggest possible number. You know, if you just read like 100 megs in a row off of a disk or write 100 megs in a row onto a disk, you got no fragmentation. It makes a really big number. It makes you feel happy. But that's not the way working with an actual file system of production works. One meg random IO is pretty close to contiguous performance. And more importantly, it's about the best you'll ever actually see in the real world. So it boils down to if all you're doing is simple file sharing, record size equals one meg. If you don't know you have random IO, record size equals one meg. If you do have the random IO, like the MySQL, now we're kind of back into that whole read, modify, write cycle issue again, and also just having to read in more data than you really need. If your database only wants 16K worth of data, you don't want to commit the drive, uh, the, the, the drive IOPS and throughput to feeding it one meg of data, which it's going to throw away almost the entirety. We have already thoroughly covered this, small blocks, small files. All right, so the final thing about record size that we want to talk about, uh, again, we, we've covered this a little bit. Blocks are stored intact on mirrors, but they're split and striped across RAID BDEVs. Um, now, that also means that 
your individual, the, the smaller the, the chunk size is, for lack of a better word, on your videos. Like if you've got um, default record size equals 128K and you've got eight data drives in your VDEV, then you're looking at, what is that, uh, 60, no, 8K? 16K. You end up with 16K for each individual drive. To read a record, you're asking each individual drive for 16K of data or to store 16K of data. Now that's very small block size random IO. That's hard on the drives. That's easy to get really badly fragmented, have a ton of seeks, very low performance. That's not something that you want, which is why um, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the, but, but this is why you don't want to have a small record size on really wide RAID ZV devs. It ends up being a very bad idea. Mirrors don't have that problem because the whole record goes onto one disk. It's not further subdivided. And the final thing is you can make a RAID Z VDEV of any width you want. So a RAID, 6 VDEV, a RAID Z2 VDEV could be five disks wide and have you know three chunks of data and two chunks of parity for each record, right? But what happens if you try to divide 128K by three? You don't come up with an even number. So what actually happens is you've got to pad the individual chunks on each drive of the VDEV, which means that, again, you're kind of wasting resources, right? You're reading more data than you need to off the drive. You're writing more data than you need to. You're wasting IOPS. It's not a great time either for performance or in terms of your storage efficiency. So try to avoid that if you can. Uh, we'll go into blessed topologies a little bit later. Now, the most senior remaining open CFS developer on the planet, uh, Matthew Ahrens, he is a big fan of saying, don't worry about it. Just make your RAID ZV dev whatever size you want and live with it. It's less of a problem than you think it is. He's not wrong, but that doesn't mean that there's no problem at all. So if you can, you want to have your VDEV size so that your data splits up evenly and you don't need that padding. All right. Performance does not scale with the number of disks in your system. It scales with the number of VDEVs. Uh, that means that mirrors outperform everything else because you have more VDEVs for the same number of disks and because you're not splitting your records into these teeny tiny chunks. They're going intact onto the individual drives. And, narrow, and this is the thing that breaks people's brain. And it's not just ZFS. This is conventional rate also. Narrow stripes outperform wide stripes. This graph here demonstrates that. The top line, now this is an eight drive system and the uh, top reddish orange line, that's single disk VDEVs. So it goes all the way up to eight disks, our full eight bays. And you can see our, our uh, 4K write performance, it increases pretty much linearly with each new VDEV that's been dropped into the system. Now the next line, is uh, two wide mirrors. So obviously it only goes up to four. At that point, you know, the system's full, but you'll notice it does the same thing. It increases linearly with each new VDEV added. Now the final drive, or the final line, I'm sorry, the, the dotted line that doesn't really seem to be going anywhere, that is a single RAID Z2 VDEV, but I'm adding a new disk for every additional spot on there. So what we're looking at there is the number of data drives in that VDEV as it gets increasingly wider. And as you see, the performance not only doesn't go up, it eventually starts to go down. Please, please don't expect super high performance out of a great big wide RAID Z1, RAID Z2, RAID Z3 VDEVs. Everybody does, they're wrong. They would have been wrong with RAID 5 conventional. They would have been wrong with RAID 6 conventional. <laughs> All right, so blessed topologies. Mirror VDEVs outperform everything else and they're really easy to manage. Let's say that you've got an eight drive system and you've got six drives. So you've got three mirror VDEVs, right? You want more space. You're starting to get a little full in your pool. Add another mirror VDEV, easy, done. Now you've got an eight drive system. You've, it's fully populated. You've got four individual mirror VDEVs. Space is starting to get a little tight, but when you built that system, four terabyte drives were large. Well, now it's 2021, you can buy 20 terabyte drives. You only need to replace two drives to get that additional 16 terabytes worth of storage. Whereas if you had you know, an eight wide RAID Z2, you would have to replace each individual drive one by one, waiting for it to resilver each time. And only once the eighth and final drive was replaced, would you see a single byte of additional storage. Um, now, not everybody wants to do mirror VDEVs. A lot of people get upset at only having 50% storage efficiency. 
The first thing I say to those people is get over it. <laughs> but the second thing is, you know, if that really bothers you that much, a nice compromise is three wide RAID Z1. Now, normally, people will say you should not use RAID 5 for anything anymore. It's not enough parity. It's not enough redundancy. And for the most part, I agree. But three wide RAID Z1 is a sweet spot. It doesn't have the read modify write cycle problems of conventional RAID. And it's a very narrow stripe. So it still performs very well. It still resolves really quickly. And for three drive RAID Z1, how many pieces do you have to split each record into? Anybody? Two. <laughs> so they will split evenly. There's no weird padding. So you literally have just a very simple, predictable 67% storage efficiency. It's better than 50, still performs pretty well, still pretty easy to manage. Finally, if you want to go into RAID Z2, you want to, you want to have absolute guaranteed I can lose any two disks in this system and not lose data. That's where RAID Z2 comes in. And I would recommend it in four wide, six wide, or 10 wide. Because again, once you, you know, get rid of the parity, you're talking about having two wide, split your data evenly in two pieces. You're talking about four wide, evenly in four, or eight wide, evenly in eight. So you don't have the padding. Uh, you don't have as much confusion about what your storage efficiency really is or really isn't. And you've got a maximum of performance. Cursed topologies. Never use single disk VDEVs because if you lose any individual disk, you lose all of your data and you're going to have a bad time. Uh, RAID Z1 should never be wider than three disks. Uh, modern drives are very large. It takes quite some time to resilver them. And if you've got a wide RAID Z1, you will be absolutely sweating bullets when that one disk fails and you not only cannot afford to lose another disk, you're immediately uncovered. So if you've got a wide RAID, let's say you've got a 10 wide RAID Z1, right? And you lose a single disk. If there is one single corrupt sector already lurking in any of those nine remaining individual drives, you have lost your ability to repair that. That sucks, don't do it. Finally, we don't want very wide RAID Z VDEVs of any level. Now you'll notice that I did not include any RAID Z3 on my personal list of blessed topologies. Uh, I don't think it's a very effective VDEV type, honestly. It just encourages people to make extremely wide VDEVs that will perform terribly, that will be a lot more you know, prone to having problems and take a hellaciously long time to resilver. It's generally just not worth it. As an example, if you were to create a single 18 wide RAID Z2 you know, in a, in a system with 20 bays in it, you would end up splitting down into 8K individual pieces of data with the default 128K record size. That is going to perform horribly. Um, above and beyond the fact that every single type of IO you do to all those drives will be 8K random, you also have to keep in mind the fact that a VDEV is only as fast as the slowest drive in that VDEV. Now, naively, you might think, well, they're all, I don't know, let's say, uh, you know, Seagate, Iron Wolf, 12 terabytes. So they're all the same, right? No, they're not. On any given individual operation that depends on all 18 of those drives, they're going to return the data in slightly different increments. But the whole operation only completes as fast as the slowest one out of all 18 every time, whichever one that is. So your performance just keeps nosediving as your VDEVs get wider. All right, enough of the topology stuff. Let's talk about snapshots. The practical definition of a snapshot, it's a complete copy of the entire data set from any given point in time. A more technical definition, what the snapshot really is, it's a copy of the block pointer tree, which is what tells the file system which blocks belong to any given file or whatever. So you just copy the entirety of the block pointer tree without copying the blocks. And any given block remains immutable unless there are no further snapshots linking to that block, right? And if you ask to rewrite that block, unlike a traditional file system, ZFS will say, sure, I'll rewrite that block for you, but it's really lying. Really, it makes a new block with your new data, links that to the current file system. And any of the snapshots that still link the old version are just unchanged. They still link to the old version, which is still immutable. Examples, so you take a snapshot, ZFS snapshot, pool slash data set at snapshot name. You can roll it back instantly. Now, taking a snapshot, instantaneous. I don't care how big your data set is. You take that snapshot, command returns. Because again, you're just saying this block pointer tree is immutable and making a copy of it. 
It's very rapid. Uh, rollbacks are also very rapid because you're not actually writing data on disk. If I've got a 10 terabyte virtual machine image and I overwrite the entire freaking thing and realize I did a dumb thing and I say, I want to roll back to the last snapshot I took before I was very dumb, you may be changing 10 terabytes worth of data, but you're not reading or writing that data from the drive. You're just going back to the earlier copy of that block pointer tree that still points to all those same blocks, which we never wrote over because again, blocks are immutable as long as anything is pointing to them. Finally, you can clone a snapshot. Uh, if I say ZFS clone pool data set at snapshot name to pool temp, what I do is I create a new data set on temp that is based on that snapshot, but the clone, unlike the snapshot, is mutable. You can write to it. You can take snapshots on the clone. You can do whatever you want. And that also, again, is instantaneous because you're not actually copying all that data. It's just another block pointer tree. So when we say atomic cow, what we're talking about is copy on write for the cow, and atomic just refers to atomic instance in time, meaning that you can't do anything else while a snapshot is being taken. Uh, it happens instantly, and it can't be in the middle. Of, nothing else can be in the middle of a snapshot being taken. They are always consistent. All right. I'm just going to take a look at what all this looks like. Uh, we have here a simplified diagram of what it looks like if you're doing random access inside a large file on a traditional file system like ext4. Now, the dark red blocks are things that we are saying, hey, I want to modify the values in those blocks, and the file system does exactly what you wanted it to. It modifies those values in those blocks. And a copy on write file system, it says it's doing that. But what it really does, as we discussed earlier, is it makes a new copy of that block and it links the current file system to the new copy, but it leaves the snapshots, if there are any, linked to the old copy. Now, where there aren't any snapshots, it still doesn't ever modify things in place. It creates a new block, links to that one, and then unlinks the old one. So you get what you, know, you can visualize as sort of like a data comment, right? You keep kind of moving new data across the drive and unlinking data behind it. That's kind of neat to look at but it's harder to build other things on that as a visual. So logically, it's the same thing as if you just envisioned all the blocks in a contiguous mass and the tail of it gets eaten away as the new stuff gets written. So now we've got a data worm instead of a data comet. Now this, although it's one step logically further removed from reality, let's just show you what it really looks like to take a snapshot. So we're writing data, we're unlinking data, but we're also taking snapshots and the snapshots can overlap. So right now we've got two snapshots and they partially overlap one another and they partially overlap the current live file system, which is still moving and changing. But you see that even though the current file system no longer contains most of the blocks in those snapshots, all those blocks remain immutable because something links to them so they don't change. Now, if you destroy a snapshot, then for example, if we destroyed the blue snapshot, the blocks that are blue would disappear, the ones that are green, because they were shared by both the blue and the yellow snapshot, they remain, but now they're just yellow. Okay, does everybody understand snapshots? Awesome. Now we're gonna talk about replication, but I have to open up talking about something else before we talk about replication. And that is that I love rsync. Rsync is a fabulous tool. I think we already covered like, you know, everybody, most everybody here has used Rsync. It is amazing. Um, and I say this because I'm about to take a big steaming crap all over it, which kind of hate doing. Like Rsync was my first actual professional involvement with open source. If you Google me in open source and you have the patience to go back 20 years, the first things you'll find are my postings to the Rsync mailing list in the late 90s. It is a fabulous tool. The way rsync works, a lot of people don't realize this, even who use rsync every day, it has to move through the data that you're synchronizing in three passes. In the first pass, it needs to look at all the files and compare sizes and date stamps. Now, rsync will assume that if the size of a file and the modification time on a file is the same on both your source and your target, it doesn't need to synchronize that file, right? So then you move on to the second pass. In the files that have changed, it looks at which pieces of those files have changed and builds a list of those pieces. Those are the things that it thinks it's probably going to have to move over. Now in the third pass, it looks at the relatively simple hashes that it created in the second one that say, 
this chunk of data probably changed, but that the, the second pass, the hashes that it created, they're really weak. There's a really high uh, percentage of that, that there's a really high, uh, large chance that that pass got it wrong. So on the third pass, it takes those things that it found in the second pass and it creates a much stronger uh, validation hash to figure out did this stuff really change or not. Now it knows which pieces of which files have changed and it can finally start actually moving blocks down the wire to update the target, right? Everybody fairly solid on rsync. Great. Now let's talk about how replication works. You compare the list of snapshots on the source and the target. Now you know which snapshots you don't have on the target. Well, what's a snapshot? Anybody? Block pointer tree. So you know which snapshots you don't have. You know which blocks are in them. You know which blocks are in that snapshot that weren't in the snapshots that you already have on the target. So you just immediately are sending those blocks down the wire. That's it. There's no like real multiple passes and groveling over every block of the file. You know what changed, not on a file level, on an individual block level. And you can just immediately start moving that data down the wire. Your third pass, there is no third pass. It's just you're done at that point. All right, so I told you how much I love rsync, but I come not to praise it, but to bury it. This is pretty much an example of the best case workload for rsync. This is a 158 gigabyte directory. This is actually my on-disk opt Steam library on a Linux machine. And if I don't make any changes to my 158 gig Steam library and I want to back it up with rsync, it takes... 15 seconds because you've got to stat all the individual files and in that 158 gigs worth of data. Now, obviously 15 seconds is a lot faster than reading the entire 158 gigs data. But when we compare that to replication, replication manages the whole thing in only two because it doesn't have to even so much as check timestamps. It already knows what blocks are or are not missing. But eh, seven and a half times speed increase, who cares, right? So let's look at a 40 gigabyte Windows 7 virtual machine image. To do the same thing there where we're resynchronizing this image, rsync has to read the whole image on both sides, which takes it 19 minutes and 17 seconds on that system. Sync, uh, ZFS replication gets done in, uh, what was that, four seconds, I think. I probably actually did change a couple of blocks in that file. That might seem impressive, but, um, rsync can actually do a little bit better than that because by default when rsync updates things on the target it actually writes a new file it doesn't update in place it makes a whole separate copy and then throws away the original when it's done for safety now you can tell rsync don't do that i just want you to do an in place and it will speed things up because you're not creating an entire separate copy of that whole 40 gigs of data so you know now zfs replication is only 161 times faster on that 40 gig image, right? But uh, does 40 gigs sound like a reasonable size for a Windows virtual machine image? What if we look at about two terabytes instead? Well, <laughs> with two terabytes, it took me two out, it took me a little bit more than two and a half hours to do just a simple resynchronization with rsync. With ZFS replication, it once again takes well under 10 seconds. It really doesn't matter how big the overall data set is, how it's organized, whether it's millions of little teeny tiny files or whether it's one giant honking enormous file, it does not matter because ZFS already immediately knows what it does or does not need to move down the wire. It only takes as much time as it requires to actually move the changed data. Now, this is not just about elapsed time. You might look at this and say, well, two hours is not so bad. I can live with two hours. But the other thing you need to know about those two hours is that's two hours of the drives on both your production side and your backup side working as fast as they possibly can to try to do your backup routine. It's not going to be usable for those two hours because you've completely saturated all the, the IOPS and, and uh, you know, throughput of your drives. Now, on the other hand, you get done in eight seconds. That sounds a lot better, right? You can do that in the middle of the day. You can do that on the hour, every hour, the whole way through the day. You can't do that with rsync. So under the hood, we mentioned that, you know, replication is really about snapshots. You don't replicate the actual file system, you replicate a snapshot. 
And the way that works is you take a snapshot on the source and you send it to the target. Now, the first time it's a full replication, right? So if we say ZFS snapshot data set at one and then ZFS send data set at one, yes, it's still a block pointer tree, but we don't have any of the blocks. So it's not really any faster than anything else for this because you're still moving every single block. Where it gets awesome is in the next step. The next time you go to do it, you take a second snapshot. Now you say ZFS send dash I for incremental from data set at one to data set at two. Now, in order to do this, you already need to know that your remote side already has snapshot at one, right? If you get that wrong, you won't be able to receive it on the other end. So there's a lot of donkey work involved here. In order to make this work, you have to get the list of snapshots on both sides. You have to compare it. You have to find the most recent common snapshot. Then you have to find the newest snapshot on the source. Then you have to build your command for the send. Then you have to pipe it through SSH into the receive command on the other end and then hit enter and hope for the best. And you don't get a progress bar. You don't get anything else. It just, that's the bare minimum to make things work. And it kind of sucks because this is such a pain in the butt and so difficult. It took me, I think close to a decade of daily ZFS use before I realized there was any point in bothering with replication. I didn't figure that out until there came a time that I needed to update the hardware on a machine that had been an rsync based backup server and was using hard links to, you know, <laughs> maintain at a file based level, something approximating snapshots. Now that meant that as far as individual files on in my backup server went, there were like 10 million of them. I could no longer rsync from that machine to its replacement, the newer, bigger, meaner backup machine, because I literally couldn't fit the list of all the changed files in RAM. I, I couldn't buy enough RAM on that box. This, this was quite a while ago. And, you know, I think eight gigs of RAM was the most I could cram into a machine, you know, at that particular year. So I had to do ZFS replication. And now to be fair, the ZFS replication took like two days to do, and I had no progress bar and it was just an absolute nail biter, but it just flat worked where rsync absolutely couldn't. So that led me to realize I had to make this easier. There were another few years that went by that I was doing the manual replication like we just looked at. But then finally, I was like, okay, I need to build a tool for this to make this just as simple as SCP, which I did. It's called Syncoid. Syncoid just does all the donkey work for you to begin with. It reads the list of snapshots on both sides. It figures out which snapshots you need to replicate. It builds the commands for you. Uh, Syncoid does not care if this is a local replication, meaning, you know, just two data sets on the same pool or on separate pools in the same box, or whether it's remote and needs to get tunneled over SSH. It doesn't care if you're doing a poll, meaning you're on the backup side saying, hey, go out to production and pull these snapshots here. Or if you're doing a push where you're on the production side and saying, push these snapshots out to backup. Whatever it is you do, Syncoid just figures it out and handles it for you. It also adds built-in network buffering, built-in inline compression to save your network bandwidth. It adds a progress bar if you wanted, if you're running interactively. There is a lot of good stuff that you're getting here. And now your syntax is literally just syncoid, source, target, done. And that is our presentation. And let's see, what's our time look like? We have like 45 minutes left to go, which either means lots and lots of questions or it's beer 30 already. It's up to you guys. Yes. So the question was, is L2 work ever worth it um, if you are constrained, you cannot cram any more. I'm sorry, I have to repeat this for the folks who are on the stream. Um, the question was, is L2ARC ever worth it? If you're RAM constrained, you cannot cram any more into the machine, but you can put another drive in it. Is it worth it to try the cache VDEV? And the answer is probably, but it depends on your workload. Um, usually, the, the, the thing about it is because the hit ratio tends to be so low on this, you've got such a high hit ratio on the arc, you're really just trying to scavenge the little bits and bobs that are left over. So you're ideally going to get like maybe 30% of the stuff that would have gone to metal because the arc didn't catch it to begin with, and it may be lower than that. Um, in the past, it was even less useful because the, uh, the L2 arc was ephemeral. If you reboot your machine, 
despite the fact that the L2 arc is on non-volatile storage, the system can't use it. Now with uh, new, newer ZFS versions, that's no longer the case. The, arc, the L2 arc is persistent now, which increases its value quite a lot. In particular, it means that you may be able to get a faster boot. You may be able to populate the primary arc faster because you can actually, prop, you can actually populate it out of reads from the L2 arc, which would totally be super cool. Now, is it ever going to be an enormous night and day thing? Not frequently. Uh, I have seen a lot of anecdotal uh, reports of people say, oh, L2 arc is working great for me. Um, you will usually find that those people have literally never run a system without L2 arc because they just said, oh, that looks great. I'm going to do that from the get go. And that is the only thing they know. And because it's fast, they think that's part of why it's fast. I have done a lot of, you know, before and after testing, and I've very rarely seen a big difference out of it. Basically, for L2 arc to be really useful, you have to have an incredibly hot working set, meaning that you're reading the same blocks over and over and over quite a lot. And it has to be a very large hot working set that won't fit in RAM all at once. Now, if that's the case, odds are real good that you'll pick up a lot of high value blocks from the tail end of the arc. You'll be able to populate L2 arc with it, and things will be better than they would have been. But if you don't have that unusually large, unusually hot working set, which usually you're only going to find, like if you've got a server that is handling, I don't know, 100, 200 concurrent users, and they're all doing very different things, but all their individual things are very repetitive, that's the ideal case for L2ART. Fair? Um, the other thing that you might consider then is, uh, you know, if you need your maximum performance and you're completely RAM constrained, uh, usually I would say it's probably time to think about just building a second system and federating your storage between two systems with two pools, each with their own separate arc. Anybody else? Yes. So the question was, do I need to worry about having uh, super caps or battery backed devices for my log VDEV to make sure that if I have a power loss, I won't have my log VDEV in an inconsistent state? And the answer is no, you typically don't need to worry about that. Um, your pool will actually boot and import fine, even if you just completely rip the log VDEV out with dirty data on it and throw it away. The only thing that happens is you don't get those flushed dirty writes. So the net impact is you still don't have a corrupt pool. What you have is a pool that effectively crashed like five seconds earlier in time than it did in, you know, like corporeal human time. Um, the, now, the thing that can be handy about using, uh, you know, battery or capacitor backed devices for your log is that that means your log VDEV will be able to return that sync call even more quickly because your data, as long as it's protected by that super cap or whatever is in that enterprise grade SSD, the SSD can say, okay, I got it. You can move on instantly before it's even committed it actually to the flash because it's relying on its super cap to carry it through any problems with the power loss. So you can get a performance increase out of using enterprise grade drives with the super cap. You will not get any kind of a true reliability increase because again, the net impact if you lose the data in that log is not corruption. It's just moving back a few seconds in time to effectively when the crash happened. Make sense? Yeah, I do. And, you know, the other thing to keep in mind about that is that, so if you've got a five second uh, TXG sync commit interval, that's the maximum amount of time that can be dirty in the log, right? But you're not really talking about risking that entire five seconds either because the rights to the log VDEV are also atomic. You can't have half a write. Half a write just gets thrown away. So what really you're talking about, you're talking about the difference between uh, a crash that happens when it really happened versus happening like a couple of milliseconds earlier, because you're really talking about the difference in time between the performance of the super cap back drive versus a non super cap back drive. So really, you're typically going to be talking about, well, instead of saving all of these five seconds of data that was maybe flushed into my ZIL, I'm gonna be saving like, you know, 
four seconds and 953 milliseconds worth of data, not the entire 5,000 milliseconds. So it's, it's just really not a huge deal in practice. Um, again, the, the reason that I would say consider, you know, an enterprise drive, like I really like Kingston DC 500 M's. Uh, they cost almost nothing more than just like a Samsung pro, which used to be, you know, one of my favorite go-tos. Uh, but they have, um, they do have super cat backing and they also have, um, Oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, Good Lord. My, my mind is like kind of bouncing into network admin mode when it should be storage admin mode. And I'm thinking like, you know, uh, traffic shaping. But basically it boils down to uh, the, the Samsung VDEVs. The Samsung SSDs can be really, really bursty. Um, so you can end up with a big bottleneck while it commits one workload. Um, quality, quality of service. That's the word I was looking for. The, the Kingston and other enterprise SSDs they have quality of service, which means that they're a lot less bursty. They're a lot less likely to leave you waiting for one big batch of things to commit before they can do the next thing. So the performance is a lot more predictable. But that applies more for the data VDEVs than it really does for the log. Again, for the log, the only thing is just, the only thing is how quick can I return from a sync? And the ideal log VDEV is not one of those either. It's Intel Optane. Uh, now, the reason for that is Intel Optane, it, it's not a very high throughput device, but it's incredibly low latency, which again, remember, is exactly what you want in the log VDEV. The entire point of the log VDEV is to give you lower latency and when you can return from that sync call. The other thing that Optane offers you is just absolute UFO class write endurance. Um, a, a standard NAND SSD, um, even if it's uh, you know MLC instead of TLC, you're usually going to be looking at somewhere around... 40 to 80 full drive writes before you start seeing performance nosedive on that SSD, right? It's so like if you've got a one terabyte SSD, you can probably write about 80 terabytes to it before your performance starts decreasing. And that doesn't mean the drive is just going to fail on you at 80 terabytes. It's not even close to failing, but the performance really starts tailing down and it's never going to come back. Optane, on the other hand, I don't know what it takes to exhaust the endurance on an Optane drive. It's not NAND flash. It's a MemRistor type technology. And as far as I can tell, it's basically infinite, which again is great on something that is going to be a relatively small device that's going to have to take like all the ephemeral changes that are targeted for potentially hundreds of terabytes of raw storage. So Optane, ideal. Uh, beyond that, SuperCat backed enterprise drives are the best choice. Um, I do not recommend really consumer SSDs at all for a log VDEV because again, the whole idea is you need this really low latency and uh, like a Samsung Evo or, you know, similar like, you know, Western Digital Blue, very consumer SSDs, um, they're TLC or even QLC flash. Uh, they do not have any kind of QoS. They can be extremely bursty and unpredictable. And in some cases, a an unpredictable kind of slow consumer SSD may actually decrease your performance over having no log VDEV at all. Kind of counterintuitive, but I've seen it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Well, again, you're not really talking about the full five seconds. You're talking about, you know, a few milliseconds and it's on you to determine whether the possibility of your crash effectively having happened five milliseconds before it did, is that worth, you know, the, the super cap? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's on you to figure it out. But the point is, that's the only risk. You're not worried about a corruption event. You're not worried about, you know, losing the entire contents of the ZFS intent log you're literally worried about potentially like one extra transaction that you did or didn't save. Well, sure, except you, you said ACID compliant specifically. And if you're ACID compliant, your database is operating in transactions and it will not be corrupt on the database level or on the application level because an incomplete transaction is rolled back to the transaction prior. So you're talking about the point in time at which it stopped working. You're not talking about corruption. You're not talking about um, a lack of consistency. Okay, 
if you're not wrapping your stuff in transactions, you're not asset compliant in your database. And all that happens way before you hit the file system, let alone the hardware. I don't want to tell you about that. Right. So um, repeating for the benefit of folks listening to the stream, uh, the gentleman was saying that he's seen issues with incomplete writes causing uh, database level inconsistency on cheaper SSDs with no super caps. ZFS already solved that problem by being atomic itself. You can't have a half write on ZFS. You cannot because every write is, is atomic. It either happened or it didn't. So you can, move your you can move your crash back in time to an earlier crash consistent level, but you can't have corruption of the type where you're talking about where you have like half a write done. Now you can still have application level consistency if you as the application developer have failed to properly uh, you know, wrap your queries in transactions so that you maintain application level consistency. There's nothing a file system can do about that, but also there's nothing that a super cap can save you from on that. Because the file system underneath it is already atomic, which ext4, xfs, et cetera, are not, you already don't have the type of inconsistency you're talking about, whether you got a log VDEV or not. Make sense? <laughs> I don't think you want to agree, but I promise you, it genuinely does work that way. The copy on write nature of the file system already solved the problem you're talking about, what the super cap does is it just keeps you from moving backwards a little in time to effectively when that crash happened. You're always gonna be crash consistent. The super cap just means that you potentially will have, you know, your crash consistency will be at a point in time a few milliseconds later than it would have been without it because there's one more transaction you don't have to roll back. Whether you're talking about the database transaction or whether you're talking about the TXG sync at the file system level, either way. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, the question was about ZFS native encryption, uh, performance, potential foot guns, et cetera. Uh, do I have any commentary on that? Um, not a ton. Uh, I am still just at kind of the feet wet stage with the ZFS native encryption, to be honest. Now, ZFS native encryption is very promising um, because not only do you get at rest encryption, remember we talked about the replication. Uh, if you're using ZFS native encryption, you can replicate to an untrusted target because even though you still get the really cool asynchronous and incremental replication we were talking about, the data healing, the whole nine, your replication target doesn't have to possess the key to decrypt any of that data. So you can do a raw send replication to a completely untrusted target without having to worry about the target getting access to your actual data. Um, now, one potential foot gun there, if you consider uh, if you consider data set names, for example, to be, uh, you know, confidential protected data, uh, you will be able to see the names of data sets on the untrusted target that does not have the key. There's, uh, there's a non-zero amount of metadata that's not encrypted, but all of the actual data contents are encrypted and cannot be accessed without the key. So that's pretty cool. Um, in the very first versions of ZFS native encryption that came out, there was kind of an ugly kerfuffle um, on the Linux side in between the kernel developers and the ZFS developers. Um, one of the Linux kernel developers stopped exporting a symbol that's necessary to maintain the state for uh, hardware decryption. And that broke things in the ZFS land and they had to do you know, a software workaround and it was really crappy for performance, whatever. All that has since been worked around. Um, there was nothing magical about the kernel's own state tracking mechanism for the, uh, you know, for um, the, the registers used for the hardware encryption. ZFS devs just had to re-implement that for themselves and they have since done so and that performance, uh, you know, potential performance problem went away. Now, as far as the overall performance issues now, um, every once in a while you see somebody complaining. I haven't seen any particular issues in the testing that I've done, um, you know, usually on pretty beefy systems with native encryption but it's not something that I'm genuinely truly relying on day to day yet because I'm extremely conservative with my storage.
Uh, do you have any other specific questions that didn't cover about encryption? Yeah, I, I'm at about the same level you are. Um, you know, I've I've played with it on you know laptops, my workstation, or whatever. But my production storage is not using at rest encryption yet. Um, I will probably start doing that on a trial basis with a few of my VM hosts any day now, basically, because it would be nice to do that. You know, like with uh, rsync.net as the ZFS replication target. Not that I don't trust those folks, I do, but you know, they're not me. So it would be nice to you know not have the key exposed there in case there's a you know, you get a colo technician who's not trustworthy or whatever. It's just one less thing to worry about, except for the fact that if you encrypted your data, you have to worry about something going wrong with the encryption. So um, I tend to have fewer concerns about that in, about that level of at-rest encryption. The really important data to encrypt at rest um, in my own workloads is generally encrypted at the application stack level already. So I'm not really worried about it at the file system level. but um, I, I will gently be introducing more of that as time goes by. I, I do occasionally see people expressing difficulties with uh, incremental replication chains getting interrupted. Uh, you know, like if they're using Syncoid, for example, to, to manage replication from a source to a target. It seems like people more frequently encounter a problem that breaks replication when they have encryption enabled than not, but I don't really have a firm grasp on why. There may be a couple of bugs there. I haven't seen people losing data. It's just more of a, you know, th there may be some hassle that you need to deal with as that kind of gets sorted out. Yeah. <laughs> Not a very detailed data point, I think, is a, a fair description of where we're at right now with, the, with ZFS native encryption. It's almost certainly fine for whatever you want to do. If you're very conservative like I am, you, you might want to take your time dipping your feet into it rather than just jumping in head first. Yes. The question was uh, resources that I might recommend for somebody who is, you know, looking for an overall ZFS education. Uh, Michael Lucas and Alan Jude um, have written a book, I believe it's called ZFS Mastery, that is generally pretty well reviewed. I have not actually read it because they waited too long to write it and I didn't need it by that point. Um, it is very well reviewed. I, I can't personally specifically endorse how great it is. Um, beyond that, uh, if you look at my blog, jrs-s.net, there is a ton of stuff, you know, with my testing and experiments and documentation or whatever with, uh, usually it's more practical, you know, issues with ZFS workflow. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I, uh, I have been a, uh, technology reporter for Ars Technica for a couple of years, and I've written some extremely thorough uh, you know, ZFS overviews, both ZFS by itself and ZFS versus conventional RAID, you know, you name it. Um, obviously, I recommend those. I wrote them. It's a great place to start. Um, ideally, within a year or two, I will have also written a ZFS book, but that hasn't happened yet, so I can't recommend it to you yet. <laughs> Anybody else? Or is it Beer 30? Thanks, everybody.